All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as everyone is joining, I just wanted to welcome you all to a cardiology subspecialty virtual morning report. Uh, today, I'm really excited because we have um, just a phenomenal educator here and a phenomenal case presenter here who's going to um, make this session possible. And my name is Maddie Conti. I'm a medical student between my third and fourth year on a research year, and I'm going to be facilitating the session today. Um, so I will jump into the introduction of our uh, specialist discussant. So uh, Dr. Maria Pabon, she uh, completed her MD in Bogota, Colombia. Then in 2014, she moved to New York City as a research fellow in the lab of Dr. Augustine Choi in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Weill Cornell. Uh, in 2017, she started her medical residency um, at Weill Cornell, where she stayed for an additional year as a chief resident. And then in 2020, she began her fellowship training in cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And her clinical and research interests are in the cardio obstetrics and women's health field. Um, so Maria, thank you so, so much for being here. We're really excited to learn from you. And um, I'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit about how you developed um, the interest in cardio obstetrics. Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, yeah, so cardio obstetrics is a, uh, it's like a, a blooming field in cardiology. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of people that go into internal medicine, just like you know, many of you guys want to go, um, you know, after we complete medical school, we're, we don't see pregnant patients, basically never. Um, and so when I started my fellowship at Brigham, I um, encountered myself in several, you know, instances where I was the consult fellow and um, I had, you know, consults in the OBGYN floor and every single time I got a page from, you know, tachycardia in pregnant patient, I would just be so scared. And so I decided I wasn't going to be scared about it. And I started to like read about it, learn about it. Um, and that's how I just fell in love with it. It's it's super interesting and just such a pleasure to um, follow pregnant patients that have either congenital heart disease or acquired heart disease um, during their pregnancy and, you know, uh, guiding management and preventing complications. Um, cardio obstetrics uh, also um, involves pre-pregnancy counseling, so people that have heart disease and want to become pregnant, um, you know, they come for consults to see, you know, what their recommendations are, what differences in management there will be during the pregnancy, um, or is it, you know, pregnancy not recommended in certain instances, like people that have really bad pulmonary hypertension or um, really bad valvular heart disease, um, and then Cardiobstetrics also follow women postpartum uh, because in the postpartum period actually is where a lot of the complications from pregnancy happen. Uh, the cardiovascular complications from pre pregnancy happen. It's it's often reserved as the uh, fourth trimester. Um, so yeah, so that's why I um, I got into this and I'm interested in in women's health in general and and specific interest in this. Wow, just. Thank you so much for describing that. I think you have a lot of people who are now more interested in it. I think you, you just uh, your passion for that is you know contagious. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was also curious if you have um, like what other interests or hobbies do you have outside of medicine these days? Yeah, um, I love yoga. That um, I try to do at least twice a week or something. Um, during my first years of fellowship, I wasn't as good clearly, but I try. Um, recently, I've gotten into like plants and like caring for plants so I have a bunch of plants in my house and I'm you know I learn about every single one of them and you know what their requirements wow. are and so I'm like a little bit of a plant crazy lady um my boyfriend is not very happy about it but <laughs> I enjoy it <laughs> well Yasmin here who uh, will be helping with um either scrubbing or teaching for the care over is a, a, another fellow plant lover you can see in her background <laughs> oh yes <yeah. laughs> Awesome. Well, um, our incredible case presenter is the one and only Gerlene Carr. Gerlene, do you want to, um, she's a PGY2 internal medicine resident, also at Brigham and Women's. And Gerlene, do you want to um, unmute, introduce yourself and also share kind of a, an interest you have um, outside of medicine these days? I know it must be hard with residency. Hi, everyone. I'm Gerlene. I'm so excited for Maria to be here and to learn from her, discuss this case. And it's so good to be back on BMR. It's been a really, really long time, obviously, with, with residency and everything. I haven't been able to join, but 
I'm really excited for today. In terms of things outside of medicine, I I'm I really enjoy like art things, but I'm not good at it. But I've been recently trying to like do a little some activities. Like I did marble painting the other day, which is oh. like where you have like the water and you um have paint on like the paper and then it, you make a design and then did like pottery painting um last week as well. So I've been trying to explore some more art stuff recently. Wow, that sounds so fun. My gosh, <laughs> so cool. All right, well, we will um, jump into the case. Just wanting to shout out the incredible team members, Shema and Yasmin, who will be helping with scribing and teaching points. Um, so the scribe can go ahead and Shema, I think that's you, you can share your screen. Um, and Gurleen, feel free to jump into the first alcohol. Okay, Great. So my first aliquot. So I'll introduce just a brief HPI and then go over like the prior cardiac history in this aliquot. So this is a 71 year old with um, who was transferred from a neighboring hospital after he presented with three months of progressive dyspnea on exertion and fatigue. He has quite some course that led up to this admission. So I'll walk you through that. So he has a history of atrial tachyarrhythmia since childhood. At one point, he was treated with digoxin for this, and then he was fine for a while until his adult life. He developed a flutter around 10 years prior to this presentation and was successfully underwent an ablation around five years ago. Three months ago, he was found to be back in atrial fibrillation, was started on anticoagulation with the Pixaban with the plan for cardioversion, but before that was able to happen, he was admitted with lethargy, anorexia, pleuritic chest pain, and shortness of breath. And at that time, at that admission, he was found to incidentally have a large pericardial effusion on a CT scan that was done prior to the cardioversion. And he also had some signs of tamponade during that time, so the cardioversion wasn't able to happen. And they did a pericardiocentesis and drained two liters of bloody fluid. And this is a lot of information in the history, so I'll go a little slower, but basically they sent off a bunch of studies on that fluid and cytology showed atypical mesothelial cells likely reactive with a lot of blood. And then he had a subsequent echo that showed resolution of the effusion and he was discharged on colchicine. He came back and got the cardioversion a few weeks later and his ejection fraction was 50 to 55% at that time, and he had normal right ventricular function. They tried to cardiovert him two times, but it, they were unsuccessful in converting his rhythm. And then they admitted him again. They tried antiarrhythmics and then cardioverting. They were unsuccessful again. And at this time, his echo showed a newly reduced ejection fraction to 40 to 45% and reduced right ventricular function as well. That's the end of the first aliquot. I know it's a lot of information, but kind of sets the scene to who this person is coming in. All right, yeah, Maria, as, as Gurleen said, I'm curious how this you know, cardiac history is kind of influencing how you're thinking about the more current presentation of these three months of progressive dyspnea and fatigue. Yeah, I um at first I was um I was captivated by the fact that he's had atrial tachyarrhythmia since childhood, um, suggesting that there's you know some disease process that has been going on for a really long time. But it's a little bit um I wonder, do we know what type of tachyarrhythmias did he have in childhood, Corleen? No, he doesn't remember. He just knows that at one point he was put on digoxin for a little bit, and then after that he's been fine all along until he had this a flutter 10 years ago interesting yeah um yeah it's it's a little bit strange um because usually usually atrial tachyarrhythmias that happened earlier in life are you know like the typical supraventricular tachycardias that are paroxysmal and then people take kind of like the pill in the pocket um you know, the pill in the pocket form of treatment. Um, but it's interesting that he afterwards developed a flutter and AFib, which of course um, are a little bit more worrisome because the new anticoagulation, which he was appropriately started in. Um, but the fact that at some point he had, you know, a pericardial effusion and then just this chronic, not, I guess, subacute symptoms of fatigue, 
Um, and then this new reduced biventricular function, uh, this function made me think that it's possibly, you know, we're dealing with something like uh, some sort of cardiomyopathy, um, like amyloidosis or an infiltrative uh, disease that, you know, can lead to, can predispose patients to have atrial arrhythmias. In fact, that sometimes that's one of their uh, first presenting, um, you know, signs. Um, so that's what I'm kind of thinking about. But I'd love to know more about, you know, his past medical history and other things that could put him at risk for different types of cardiomyopathies. Amazing. And, and one question I had, you know, especially for kind of the earlier stage learners um, on this call is if, you know, for tachyarrhythmias, could you just kind of walk us through how you think about them, you know, the different types? Yes. So tachyarrhythmias, um, obviously, you know, it's when the heart goes fast. So it can be due because of atrial arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias. And so in terms of atrial arrhythmias um, that are much more frequent, um, you have many different types. Um, some of them include like just sinus tachycardia. So, you know, when people are, um, you know, lows blood or they're sick or infected, um, anxious, you know, you can have uh, sinus tachycardia. Um, other types of atrial arrhythmias that are common are um, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter um that are similar in certain things and different in certain things but um include like a re-entry kind of uh pathophysiology mechanism of the development of the arrhythmia um usually these arrhythmias can be can be treated either with medications in terms of rate control or with rhythm control like antiarrhythmics as this patient was at some point in um, or with ablation like this patient had, um, meaning they just go and burn the, um, the place where the arrhythmia is coming from. Um, as someone, uh, Joy, said that another type of, other two types of arrhythmias is AVNRT and AVRT, um, which include, uh, it's, it's nodal reentry tachycardia, that's what AV, AVNRT means, um, and include just kind of like a circuit that goes around the heart, um, and that circuit is, you know, it, when it starts, it kind of like makes the heart really go beat really fast. Um, and so uh, what you want is kind of stopping the cycle either by, you know, Valsalva maneuvers or by a cardioversion or other, or medications can sometimes help. Um, and then uh, another one is that multi multifocal atrial tachycardia or MAT, uh, which some of you have heard. Um, it's uh, usually more common in people that have history of lung disease, and it, you can you can uh, identify it on an EKG because the uh, P waves will have different morphologies, usually like three or more morpho different morphologies, suggesting different focus where uh, the arrhythmia is coming from in the atrium. Those are the uh, atrial arrhythmias. And then ventricular arrhythmias are another, you know, separate thing, but obviously the things that you can't forget or miss are uh, ventricular tachycardia, including torsades, and then uh, ventricular fibrillation, which is obviously all of them are very worrisome. Amazing. That was such clear teaching on atrial and um, ventricular <laughs> tachycardia. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Gerline, we'll jump to the next alpha. Yeah. So he Picking up from that, he had this echo that showed a newly reduced EF to 40 to 45% and also moderately reduced RV systolic function. After this, he ultimately underwent an AFib ablation as well two weeks ago prior to this presentation. This current admission happened because he went to his cardiologist for follow-up and was found to be hypoxic to 92% and hypotensive to 86 over 62 and was also back in AFib at this point. So he's been having these three months of progressive dyspnea that didn't get better when they did the ablation that was successful either. At baseline, he tells you that he's a hiker with great exercise capacity, but now has dyspnea with even three to four steps. And during the past three months, he's had early satiety, anorexia, also increase in lower extremity edema, and he's noted a 14 pound weight loss over the past one year. And when he presents to the hospital, he continues to be short of breath and fatigued, but hasn't had any more chest pain, no palpitations, lightheadedness, or dizziness. 
Then for his current medications prior to admission, he was on the dofetilide for his AFib, apixaban, colchicine for the pericarditis, pericardial effusion, on Lasix, and then metoprolol succinate. He has no other, um, no smoking history, no recent travels, and no, no exposures that he um, knows of, except maybe like a, he, he had a basement in the house that his family remodeled with asbestos in it. His family history, he had a brother who died of amyloidosis and has no other cardiac history in his family at all. And then I'll give you the initial physical exam in this aliquot as well. Um, he was afebrile, heart rate is 90. Blood pressure is 84 over 63. And he's setting 95% on six liters. This is the vitals and exam when he is in when he's in our hospital, but he's come from a, another hospital and he had some labs and imaging there that I'll share in, in the next aliquot. General appearance, he's lying in bed and he appears uncomfortable. For his cardiac exam, his JVP is around 10 to 12 centimeters. He has prominent B waves. Otherwise, he's regular rate and rhythm. That This is what was documented. I think he was in and out of AFib at times during this admission. Has a two out of six holosystolic murmur best heard at the left lower sternal border that increases with inspiration. He has decreased breath sounds at the bases bilaterally on pulmonary auscultation and no wheezing, ronchi, or crackles. And his extremities are warm, has some slight peripheral edema to the shins. And I'll leave it at this for this aliquot. Someone asked, what is his work? He's a retired engineering professor. All right, so a lot of information again. Um, Maria, I'm curious, you know, how this additional background information and this physical exam is affecting how you're thinking of the patient at this point. Yes, so um, so several things. Can I ask you a few questions before that? So um, first of all, uh, do we know if the rate, uh, what after the attempted cardioversions that failed, um, he was on the fetalide and metoprolol, was his rate well controlled? That sort of we know. Yeah, so I think it was his rate was well controlled. So he was admitted for the dofetilide loading, and then cardioversion was reattempted while he had been on dofetilide, and it was unsuccessful times two again. So he had the two cardioversions were unsuccessful without being on dofetilide, and then with dofetilide as well. His rates were, I think, fine, but they were thinking that he's not tolerating the rhythm as well. So they're trying to um, cardiovert and see, and then ultimately during all of this two weeks prior to presentation, he had the ablation. And he, for a period of time, was no longer in AFib, but was still having like the dyspnea on exertion and his symptoms didn't get any better. Got it. Um, the reason why I'm asking is because we now have a patient that has this, uh, you know, months of fatigue, uh, sounds like lower extremity edema, dyspnea on exertion, um, weight loss, uh, which suggests some sort of cardiac cachexia. Um, and so now we're dealing again with, we're going back to like, there's certainly a cardiomyopathy that's happening. Um, it seems to be related to atrial arrhythmias. Um, his brother had history of amyloidosis, which is very worrisome, um, as it, it actually correlates, uh, associates with atrial arrhythmias, just like on our patient. Um, but another possible etiology of cardiomyopathy in a patient like him is actually, uh, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So sometimes when people are going really fast, the heart cannot take it and you can see decreases in the um, in EF, in the LV function. Um, so that's something that, you know, if, if someone, for example, comes in with AFib that started three months ago and then suddenly you notice a drop in EF, it's something that you want to, uh, you want to make sure that this is not related to just, you know, the person going really fast because of the arrhythmia. Um, but it, it sounds like that wasn't the case um, since he was in an antiarrhythmic and also on metoprolol. Um, so that's, you know, that's that's one possibility, but uh, we can continue to explore other possibilities of cardiomyopathy. As I said, as infiltrative cardiomyopathies like 
um, amyloidosis, which his brother has. And there's there's a, one type of amyloidosis that um, is hereditary, and it's the uh, TTR or transthyretin amyloidosis. Um, and um, this can be acquired or hereditary. And the hereditary form is actually um, very common in uh, the African American uh, population. So I'm I'm curious to to see what his race is. Um, and then usually that happens associated with other symptoms, like, you know, the typical that you hear, like the carpal tunnel syndrome, the enlarged tongue, uh, easy bruising, all of those things, the raccoon eyes, right, the, uh, just like the purpura around the eyes. Um, so again, I'm curious if he had any of these um, signs in the physical exam. Um, physical exam is certainly concerning for heart failure, and so I think, um, you know, the, the, not super elevated JVP, but um, the uh, decreased breath sounds and um, the peripheral edema um, makes me worried about um, heart failure uh, syndrome. Um, let's see what else I had um, in my notes. Oh, um, you said that he had a prior echocardiogram. I'm sure we're gonna see the images or the report. Um, was there any com comments on the thickness of the myocardium? In the echo that he had, um, like around the cardio versions, there was no comment on any like um, hypertrophy or anything. It just said the EF was 50 to 55 normal RV function. And then the echo that he had that was newly reduced to 40 to 45, that was um, at the outside hospital. So I don't remember exactly what the thickness was there, but I'll show you the echo that he had, another echo that he had in the outside hospital before presentation, like Perfect. during this admission. Mm -hmm. And Maria, one quick question I had before um, jumping to the next aliquot is uh, Gerlin talked about um, that the patient had multiple unsuccessful cardioversions, uh, if I heard that correctly. And I'm just wondering how that kind of impacts how you think of this patient. Yeah, um, usually when you have atrial tachyarrhythmia, such as AFib, um, so, okay, so let's talk about AFib management because that I think that's probably pertinent to this question. So um, I don't know if you guys remember, I think you're all too young for this. I look young, but I'm not that young, clearly. Um, when I was in medical school, um, the guidelines, you know, when you had a patient with AFib, all the guidelines suggested you have to do uh, rate control instead of rhythm control, meaning the important part is to make sure that the patients are not going too fast we don't really care if the patient is in sinus rhythm or in AFib, as long as we control the, the rate. Um, and that's what, you know, the, the mantra for treatment and management of AFib was for many, many, many years, um, until recently that some studies started to suggest that actually rhythm control strategies are better than rate control strategies, especially for patients that are diagnosed with AFib, you know, in the, like the year before, you know, the procedure that you're going to plan or whatever you're going to plan for rhythm control strategies. And the reasoning is because if you think about it, most of these arrhythmias come from the left atrium. And as the left, as people continue to be on AFib for years or months and years, um, this atria would continue to increase in size and size and size. And so a lot of these people develop really huge atria and when people have this big atria, the successful, uh, the success of uh, rhythm strategies is very limited. So um, the success of uh, cardioversion or ablation lasting for a significant amount of time is limited, um, which is why nowadays people recommend to try with aggressive rhythm strategies first uh, to prevent the atria to become big and, you know, because at that time, you're basically kind of stuck with rate control instead of rhythm control. So, but it's, it is not uncommon that we try several cardioversions uh, or people go for ablation and then years later, they come back with atrial fibrillation. Um, because, again, it's just uh, these arrhythmias can happen kind of anywhere in the uh, AFib, can happen in different foci in the left atrium. Um, so, you know, the, the bigger your left atrium, the less likely for you to uh, remain in sinus rhythm after um, an ablation or a cardioversion, et cetera. 
Amazing teaching. I, I feel like I'd never um, heard that amount of clarity on kind of rape versus rhythm control. Um, oh, good, good. Maria. <laughs> this is very helpful for me. <laughs> um, I actually was wondering if you could comment also on the whole systolic murmur on exam and um, yeah, just kind of what you make of that. Yeah, um, it sounds to me like, a, you know, just a, a mitral uh, regurgitation murmur. Um, which can happen in people that have cardiomyopathies, because as you can imagine, the, the mitral valve is like this, right? Um, and opens and closes. But when people have cardiomyopathy, especially when the heart is a little bit dilated, it's hard for the mitral valve to close. Um, so during systole, you know, the, there's a lot of regurgitating volume going up to the uh, left atrium. Um, so that's probably my guess. Um, it obviously could be uh, it says left lower sternal border. Yes. So um, it obviously could be other things. Like there's other things that can cause a similar murmur, like flow murmurs. Like if this patient has really bad anemia, like that's something that we could we could hear as well. Um, but my guess is that it's probably related to um, the cardiomyopathy, which is super common. It's a type of what we call secondary mitral regurgitation. All right. Thank you. Okay, Gerlene, we're ready for the next alquad. Great. So for basic labs, his CBC, CMP are all normal. Um, his troponin is 107. His NT pro BNP is 5,503. His CRP is 101.9. And his ESR is 72. And then I have the echo. I'll read out the echo from the um, the outside hospital. And then I I'll share the images for the EKG and the echo uh, from this current admission. So the echo that he had right before transfer showed a mild to moderate, um, mild to moderate deep left ventricular systolic function with EF of 35 to 40% with moderate systolic dysfunction of the right ventricle. He had a dilated left atrium and a small circumferential pericardial effusion with a with a pleural effusion as well. That's all that I have for the read, but the um, backup images from the current admission will be helpful. And then I'll share my screen for the EKG and the echo. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Thanks, Carly. Great. So this is the EKG if Maria wanna walk us through it and then I'll go, um, I can advance to the echo images first before talking about the rest of the data. Yeah, um, so, you know, as people always say, it's good to have a systematic approach to an EKG. So always do it the same way so you don't forget to check for everything. So the first three things that I always check for is rate rhythm axis. So um, right here, it's about a hundred um, and uh, rhythm. So you want to look for a P wave um, and to make sure that is coming from the sinus node, the P wave, ha the P wave has to be uh, up in two and in uh, V5 and V6 and um, biphasic in V1, which is exactly like what this patient has. So this is a uh, normal sinus rhythm uh, with a rate of uh, actually sinus tachycardia. Um, access here is uh, left, as we can see that the QRS is negative in AVF and two, um, suggestive, uh, suggestive of left axis deviation. Um, then after that, I usually go to intervals. Um, so I look at the PR interval first and see if there's any, um, you know, degree of uh, first degree AV block, meaning, you know, the PR interval is more than 200 milliseconds, which it doesn't seem like it is, um, or if it's short, right? When in, in cases of pre-excitation, um, you wanna make sure that, you know, the PR is not too short leading to arrhythmias um, like AVRT or AVNRT actually. Um, and then uh, the other interval you wanna look is at the QT, um, which um, seems to not be, uh, not be uh, elevated. QT, usually what you wanna see is, that the um, QT interval is less than half of the RR interval. So you look at the RR interval and if it's less than half of that, then it's probably okay. 
um, or you can cheat and it also tells you in the EKG machine, <laughs> QT corrected by heart rate. Um, and then in terms of uh, the QRS, I usually first um, actually look for Q pathological Q waves because um, I used to, when I was a medical student, I used to miss them. So I quickly usually just run through all of the leads and um, look for pathological Q waves. So uh, the one that looks a little bit suspicious is maybe in three, although I do think that there's a little bit of an R in, in there. So it's, I don't think it's a Q wave, um, but that's something that you know I, I always do. Um, and then look at the QRS. So as you can see here, the QRS is wide and it has a right bundle morphology. So the typical bunny ears in V1 and a deep S in V6. That's usually what we see in a um, right bundle branch block. And um, as you can see here, there's also uh, ST changes in V1 to V3, actually all the way to V6, but ST changes in V1 to V3 are actually expected um, in a right bundle branch block. So, you know, this is totally normal. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, you know, part of the right bundle morphology. Um, he does have this uh, T-wave inversions in more of the lateral leads, um, which, you know, we would have to see if they have been there uh, before or not. But uh, of, of, other than that, I don't see anything else. Great, thank you so much. That was really helpful. And none of the changes were different from his baseline EKG from prior. And then I'll skip over to the echo first. Um, this is your, I'll just orient everyone so I, since I have the pointer and then Maria can walk us through what you see in terms of abnormalities. But this is the parasternal long axis. So you have your left atrium going into your left ventricle, going into your outflow tract into your aorta. And then this is the most anterior chamber. So this is your right ventricle over here. Then Maria, do you want to walk us through kind of what you're noticing in terms of abnormalities here? Yeah, so I uh, noticed that um, the LV seems to be a little bit thick. Um, I'm not, you know, we would have to measure it specifically, but uh, it seems a little thick. Um, not super thick. I was expecting, you know, for amyloidosis, you it's it's very obvious. Um, the RV is a little bit big. Um, usually, what you expect is the RV, the aorta, and the LA should have should uh, occupy like one third, one third, one third of the like the window that you're looking at in the parasternal lung. Um, so as you can see here, you know the LA and the uh, aorta are more similar in size than the LV and then the RV, which is a little bit bigger. Um, the other thing I'm seeing is a small pericardial effusion. Um, which is right there. Yes, very good, Gerline. Um, Gerline is an expert in cardiology. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, she should be the expert here and not me. Uh, and this is very, and the reason why I say this is because a lot of people actually confuse that pericardial effusion with the pleural effusion that you also see in this image right there. Yeah, and the way you can uh, differentiate them is by the uh, aorta, which is right there, what Gorlin is pointing at. So if it's besides the aorta, it's usually a pleural effusion. And you can also see the coronary sinus right above the aorta, that little, yeah, that one. And so if it's kind of like that, um, you know, besides the coronary sinus and has this like um, rat tail sign, I don't know if you can see it, you know, the, the, pericard the pericardial effusion, it's like, it kind of like becomes a little bit thinner by the time it, com it comes close to the coronary sinus. Um, that's the rat tail sign um, that, you know, it's a, it's a signifies pericardial effusion. So, and you can see here also his pleural effusion is a little bit nasty. It looks like there's some complex material in there, but we'll see. Great, thank you so much. And then this is the other image that we have. So this is your parasonal short axis. You're looking at a cross section of this being your left ventricle and this being your right ventricle. And these are your uh, mitral valve leaflets. You can walk us through the abnormalities, Maria. Yeah, so again, uh, somebody commented, Joy, um, pericardial effusion. You can see it uh, anterior to the RV. Um, we can also see that the RV wall is pretty thick. Usually it's not, it's not, we don't see it as like clear as in there. Um, the, in this view, you should remember that the LV looks like a, kind of like a bagel or a donut. And then the RV is kind of wrapping around the LV, um, just like you're seeing here. Usually though, the RV is much smaller than the LV. Um, so again, this just shows that the, uh, the RV is dilated 
And as you can see here, the septum is kind of flat. Um, usually you should have like a perfect circle and the septum being flat suggests that there is um, increased uh, pressure and volume depending on if it happens in systole or diastole or both. Uh, and here, I think it happens in both. So it's probably, you know, increase pressure and volume overload from the RV kind of like pushing the um, LV. Um, that's what I'm, I'm seeing here. And we also see the mitral valve, which is like the fish mouth sort of structure right in the middle, opening and closing. Great. This is just um, more further down in the cross sections. So you don't see the mitral valve, but similar view yeah. of the left ventricle septum and the right ventricle. And everything is sort of thick, like the LV walls and the RV walls are very thick. And then the last um, image is the apical four chamber. So this is your left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle over here. Yeah, so again, just a very impressive, uh, you can see here, you know, as I said, the L, the RV should never be bigger than the LV. So the RV is definitely bigger. The RA is big um, as well. Um, so, and, and you know, even though the, the function is not great of, you know, either in the LV or the RV, um, you know, the fact that the RV is just so much bigger than the LV, even though sometimes in this view, you know, because the, that uh, the echo text kind of like want to focus on the RV. The RV looks a little bit bigger than it really is, but you know it's clear that it's definitely dilated. So I'm a little bit more suspicious of like something that affects the RV a little bit more, more than the LV. And this is the last image of the echo. Yeah. So he, here uh, we see the tricuspid valve, and um, you guys see that when the ventricle contracts. There's that blue jet that comes back to the RA, um, you know, which is basically tricuspid regurgitation. So, um, so it sounds like our murmur was actually a tricuspid regurgitation murmur, not, not a mitral regurgitation murmur. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, so that was basically what the echo showed. I'll just walk you um, everyone through the rest of the imaging. So the echo showed an EF of 40 to 45, severely depressed, right ventricular systolic function, and then a septal bounce in diastole, which was read as consistent with pericardial constriction, and then flattening of the septum as we saw in both systole and diastole, and moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. And then he had a CT chest as well. Um, I can just read out the results. The imaging isn't that remarkable. It showed a moderate to large size pericardial effusion, the CT chest was, I think, at one point done at the um, outside hospital, and then it showed some few small pulmonary nodules in both lungs, which were unchanged for two months. It looks like he'd had some previous imaging and had some bilateral effusions, but otherwise no other abnormalities. And then he underwent a right heart cath and a left heart cath as well. The um, right heart cath numbers are here. So he had a right atrial pressure of 14, right ventricular pressure was 32 over six, pulmonary artery was 32 over 12, a wedge pressure was 13, and his cardiac index was 1.97. And then in his left heart cath, there was no obstructive coronary artery disease. He had some like 15%, 20% lesions in some of his vessels. And then overall, they tried to look for um, constriction in this modality as well, but they pressures were low, so they weren't they didn't see any interdependence of the ventricle. And then the last set of data I have is a cardiac MRI that I'll read off, and then we can hear from Maria what you think about how to put all this data together. So he had a cardiac MRI that showed a severely dilated right ventricle, as we've seen on the echo, and it also showed circumferential pericardial inflammation and marked pericardial thickening, four to seven millimeters with a loculated effusion that was compressing the dilated RA. And the MRI showed pericardial constrictive physiology with paradoxical septal motion, as well as biatrial dilatation. Um, Maria, could you talk to us a little bit about kind of what you explain what constrictive physiology means on MRI and kind of the different modalities to look for constriction in terms of the echo, the cath, and the MRI? 
Yes. So constrictive, constrictive physiology or constrictive pericarditis. Um, it's interesting. It's, I think it's, it's a little bit of a difficult concept uh, or it used to confuse me. It still confuses me sometimes. Um, so I'm going to try my best to explain it as clear as possible. So usually you have the pericardium that is kind of like stretchy and like soft and it's like that because it can so when when the heart fills up with blood it can accommodate all that blood because it stretches out and the ventricles can you know expand and contract etc with constrictive uh, pericarditis this um pericardium just becomes instead of being that stretchy nice pericardium it becomes thick and stiff and it prevents the heart from expanding as it should during the cardiac cycle leading to uh, restricted cardiac filling, um, which, you know, if you don't have enough blood coming inside the ventricles, then it's not going to be enough blood go going outside the heart. Um, so, you know, leading to decreasing cardiac output, just like our patient had. Um, so um, it is important to remember that because the pericardium is so stiff, um, you have something called enhanced uh, ventricular interdependence. So what this means is, you know, the RV and the LV both share several things, right? Including the septum and then the pericardium. And so the ventricles depend on each other, right? Because the RV needs to pump blood to the LV, so the LV gets filled. Um, but in constrictive pericarditis, you actually have... Um, an enhanced interdependence because, for example, if your right ventricle fills up, it's going to push the septum towards the left ventricle and it's not going to let, let the left ventricle expand and fill up as it should during the cardiac cycle. Um, so that leads to, you know, heart failure, basically. Um, usually you can diagnose this by, so the first thing that you want, obviously, is you know, physical exam. So um, an elevated JVP uh, is one of the hallmarks um, and a Kuzmaul sign, uh, which I'm sure you guys remember is that, you know, when you take a deep breath, your CVP should decrease. Um, and in Kuzmaul sign, you don't see that decrease in CVP. Instead, you see it just stays the same or increases. Um, that's Kuzmaul sign. You can also have uh, pulses paradoxes, which is um, an exaggerated drop in uh, systolic blood pressure greater than 10 millimeters of mercury um, in some patients, but it usually is more common when people have um, like constrictive effusive pericarditis, uh, which is probably what our patient has, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And then um, on physical exam, you can also hear a pericardial knock because again, the pericardium is just so thick um, and you'll have you know, lower extremity edema and hepatomegaly, pleural effusions, et cetera. So basically all of what our patient has. Um, constrictive pericarditis has this other sort of type of constrictive pericarditis, which is called constrictive effusive pericarditis, which is that in, in addition to having this thick and very uh, stiff pericardium, you have an effusion. And as you can imagine, if already you have issues with making sure that the vo volume of blood fills up your ventricles with your thick pericardium. Imagine if you add an effusion on top of it, it just you know becomes a nightmare. And usually just really, really small um, pericardial effusions like the one our patient has can, can lead to really bad hemodynamic effects. So like people are hypotensive and in shock, um, like our patient is basically. Um, so once you see that in the physical exam, you wanna, uh, order an echocardiogram. And so in the echocardiogram, you'll see what we saw in his case. So a thick, you can see a thick pericardium. Um, you can see the septal bounds, which is just kind of like the septum kind of moving towards the RV and the LV. Um, you have something called um, respiratory variation, which is just a little bit of a fancy term for kind of the same thing as we see of increasing CVP during inspiration, sort of the same thing. Um, and you see a plump uh, IVC um, and hepatic veins. Um, and uh, MRI is very useful because you can actually kind of measure the pressures in both ventricles and look for uh, ventricular interdependence. Um, in our institution, for example, is very, very good. So sometimes, you know, we we usually just uh, do an echo and if it's still a little bit unclear, the diagnosis, we do an MRI. Um, and we reserve um, 
a right heart catheterization for the cases that are still a little bit unclear. Um, but if you are un if your diagnosis is unclear with an echocardiogram and an MRI, then the next step uh, would be to do um, just a hemodynamic evaluation with a right heart cath, where you can see um, the very typical signs of constrictive um, physiology. Um, the most famous one is the one that people call the square root sign. Um, that is basically, uh, they, in, in this particular right heart cath, you have to have a pressure catheter in the RV and in the LV. And so during diastole, um, you know, as, as the heart relaxes, your feeling pressure should go down in both ventricles. Um, but early in diastoles, the, the, both of the uh, pressures go down, but instead of continuing to go down, it actually plateaus and it kind of forms this like square root sign um, that you guys can, you know, you guys can Google it and, and you'll see the pictures um, of what it looks like. And then they also have, you know, if you remember your uh, A wave, X descent, you know, the Venus waves, you will also have this prominent X and Y descents, um, which is, you know, another usual characteristic for constrictive physiology. Um, yeah, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit, what I'm a little bit uh, surprised about is the chronicity of the symptoms and um, uh, the fact that, you know, that this person, this patient has biventricular dysfunction, which is not, you know, not super, super common actually with constrictive uh, physiology. And just to give some more context about the chronicity um, in this eloquent as well. So he had a cardiac MRI eight years ago that did show some moderate RV enlargement, severe RA enlargement. But then he had an echo like six years ago that showed only like mild RV dilatation and no TR. So it's kind of unclear to us as well, like kind of the chronicity, but it seems like he did have some RV dysfunction, maybe longer than we had first known about when we were like kind of thinking about his case. Yeah, so that makes sense. And, and it actually makes sense that the echo didn't pick it up because echoes are actually, unless you have really bad RVs, echoes are not very good at uh, RV, at looking at RVs. Cardiac MRIs are like the gold standard for RV um, disease diagnosis. Um, so I believe that eight months, eight years ago, he had these findings, and which leads me to think that it's we're probably dealing with two different things. Like we have the constrictive pericarditis um, issue that may have been related to this, you know, that, that admission with pericardial pain that you told us pretty early in the case, likely a viral infection leading to pericarditis, leading to um, constrictive pericarditis, despite uh, being treated appropriately with colchicine and hopefully NSAIDs. Um, but also the fact that eight, eight years ago, he already had some RV dysfunction um, and this history of atrial arrhythmias for a really long time is actually make me, making me think about ARVC or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, uh, which is a disease that affects the RV. It can actually affect the LV too. Um, and the, the, um, they, they actually can have not only ventricular arrhythmias, which is what you guys probably most likely have learned in, in school, ARVC is the typical story of like the really young person that has sudden cardiac death because of ventricular um, fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Uh, but there's a subset of these ARVC people that actually make it all the way to the 70s and they present with, uh, you know, atrial arrhythmias that haven't been able to be in control with um, rhythm control strategies and also with kind of like RV failure and you can actually have LV failure as well. And, um, you know, this is obviously a, not, a, not a good prognosis um, in that case, but I do think that there's two separate things. Uh, like there's the cardiomyopathy on one side and then there is um, the constrictive pericarditis on the other side. And also another very important teaching point, because I, I see it all the time um, during consults, is when you have a pericarditis patient, you have to make sure that these patients are adequately treated with colchicine for at least three months and high dose NSAIDs for at least until the uh, symptoms are 
uh, gone. And the reason is because a lot of people just, uh, you know, they come to the ED and that these people get discharged on like two weeks of colchicine, they run out and then they come like a month and a half later with horrible pericarditis constrict with a little bit of constrictive physiology. And so you want to avoid that point and you want to treat the inflammation as soon as you diagnose it. So always make sure that you treat well your pericarditis patients, because these patients that are not treated well can go and develop constrictive pericarditis, which is a much, much worse disease. Um, and the uh, mortality rate is much, much bigger than just a simple pericarditis. Maria, I'm just blown away by all of these teaching pearls and uh, just wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sherween, what, what happened with this patient? Yeah, so I have one more aliquot of some short information, just interval history, and then the diagnosis comes after this. So some more further labs. He had a negative ANA, negative double-stranded DNA, negative rho la, um, SM antibody, RNP, normal complements, normal IgG, normal SPEP and UPEP, histo and blasto were negative. He also had um, studies sent on a on pleural fluid because he had a thoracentesis that um, showed 82% lymphs in the cells and his gram stain culture, ADA, mycobacterial culture were all negative. And the cytology from the pleural studies showed just some reactive mesothelial cells and histiocytes. And then interval history. So he started on anakinra um, and continued on colchicine for this pericardial inflammation. He had increasing oxygen requirements requiring high flow nasal cannula. The thoracentesis did help some of his symptoms. His oxygen was kept not being responsive to supplemental O2. He underwent an echo with a bubble study that showed a, a PFO on the bubble study with right to left shunting, and then also became more hypotensive, had some increase in lactate with this, was started on vasopressin and epoprostenol as well. And at one point, his anakinra was increased to every six hours, which is usually not a typical dose for anakinra because his inflammatory markers continue to rise. Um, and he also required like pulse dose steroids in between this when he was becoming more unstable. So this is the final bit of information before I'll kind of walk you through the rest of the course that leads to the final diagnosis. Any thoughts, Maria, before? Um, we wrap up the case. Yeah, no, I was just, uh, I think uh, Joy had mentioned Eisenmengers. Um, but, and, and initially when you told me that he had a shunt, then that would have made sense. But although you said it was a PFO. He had a PFO and um, right to left shunting through the PFO. Through the PFO, okay. Mm -hmm. Usually Eisenmengers happens when, um, when there's a VSD or I guess an ASD. Um, and so what happens is that there is shunting from the left to the right, right? Because the left has higher pressures on the right side. Um, and eventually the right side gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the pressure increases on the right side. So the shunt reverses and goes from right to left. Um, so that's that maybe is actually one of the possibilities why he had this RV failure as well. Um, interesting though, that they didn't pick it up on the MRI eight years ago, um, which would have shown it, uh, you know, much easier than an echocardiogram. Um, the other thing is uh, you mentioned that, oh, Anna Kinra, I think that's a very good teaching point as well. So, um, you know, the, the, the treatment for pericarditis and constrictive pericarditis is, so you start with colchicine and NSAIDs, and then if the inflammatory markers or symptoms don't improve, um, you want to actually maybe try stronger um, immunomodulators. So um, some people uh, use a trial of steroids, although there is some data suggesting that uh, use of steroids can actually you know, lead to recurrent pericarditis. Um, so that's why we didn't use steroids to begin with. We use colchicine and NSAIDs. Um, but if they fail colchicine and NSAIDs, you can try a trial of steroids um, and add uh, or add an immunomodulator like Anakinra which is the one that it's most commonly used when people have um, this, you know, this disease. Um, yeah, what else? I forgot what you, other things you mentioned, but um, super interesting case. 
Did you guys uh, thought, Gorlin and your team, that this was um, two different things, like two different, like the cardiomyopathy and when the constrictive pericarditis? Yeah, that's what we were thinking as well. We couldn't really fit in the right ventricular um, dysfunction into the constrictive pericarditis at all. And we were unsure about that as well, just as you were pointing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can bring us through the rest of the course and the diagnosis. So his inflammatory markers kind of kept going up. He required like more frequent anakin, as I mentioned. He also had um, further hypotension, desatting when had escalated pressor requirements. Um, he went back into AFib, wasn't tolerating that hemodynamically. Um, ultimately, he was satting in the 70s, and concern was that he's going to need to be intubated. With anyone with really bad RV dysfunction, you worry about intubation, worsening their hemodynamics. So he actually got cannulated for ECMO in, at, at the bedside in the ICU before intubating in, in the case that he wasn't able to tolerate the, the intubation. And he was intubated and his SATs and his hemodynamics were not getting better. So he was started on VA ECMO and taken to the operating room directly. The plan was all along to go to surgery to kind of figure out the, do a pericardial stripping, but we're kind of, we're waiting to kind of have more stability and kind of see how he does. Um, so in the OR, they did an open media stenotomy. And they attempted a pericardiectomy, which demonstrated thickened nodular pericardium that was plastered to and encasing the entire heart and ascending aorta. So they, the tumor was partially removed, but ultimately it was deemed unresectable. There was just tissue kind of covering the entirety of the heart. They did close the PFO and repair the valve. He was transferred back to the ICU on ECMO and unfortunately was ultimately made CMO given how hard it was for his hemodynamics to tolerate the surgery and just how hard pericardiectomy is with high mortality and morbidity. In the operating room, they sent a bunch of cultures and pathology. They um, had negative fungal cultures, negative mycobacterial and anaerobic cultures. Um, his pericardium pathology came back as mesothelioma involving fibroadipose tissue and his lymph node tissue also showed metastatic mesothelioma and underwent an autopsy that showed this 5.3 centimeter mass encasing the heart with the final diagnosis being primary pericardial malignant mesothelioma, which just a few teaching points because I didn't know much about this is a very rare neoplasm around two, two to 2% of primary heart tumors is this primary pericardial malignant mesothelioma. So usually mesotheliomas arise from mesothelial cell linings of either the pleura, the peritoneum or pericardial surfaces. And 70% arise from the pleura, 30% from the peritoneum and only 0.7% are from your pericardium. There is we know there's some relationship between asbestos exposure and pleural mesotheliomas, but the data around pericardial mesotheliomas and asbestos exposure is not too clear. Um, but surgical resection is like the main treatment, but it's very morbid and overall prognosis is kind of poor because of this late presentation and inability to eradicate it by surgery and just the poor response to chemo and radiation. Um, but in, in retrospect, when we were thinking about this patient, we had kind of thought initially when the mesothelial cells were seen in the pleural fluid and the original pericardial cytology is just reactive because you can very often just get reactive mesothelial cells, but that might have been a clue, but we, it was hard for us to kind of pick that up as we were kind of taking care of this patient as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I, when you said mesothelial cell, I was like, oh, okay. We see this all the time as reactive uh, with inflammation. That's super interesting. I've never seen a, a primary cardiac mesothelioma before. It is definitely in one of the possible etiologies. Like if you go on like up to date and you know look for constrictive pericarditis, you will see it there. I'm sure. Um, but very interesting. Another thing that you mentioned appropriately was the absence of mycobacteria um, in the cultures, and this is because remember. In the majority of the world, TB is actually the number one cause of constrictive pericarditis. Um, it's not in this country, but you know, anywhere else, um, you know, it's a it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then again, what you mentioned, Gorlin, super super important. The pericardial stripping is a very morbid surgery, 
And so that's why treating aggressively the inflammation in your patients that have pericarditis is so important because you never want to get to that point that you need uh, pericardial stripping because the uh, mortality can be, you know, something like, I think is like something about 10, uh, 10 to 20%. That doesn't sound too big, but like that's huge for a surgery. Um, and it can be higher in patients that have, you know, that are frail, that are older, that have other comorbidities. So um, super important to always make sure that you treat adequately your patients with pericardial inflammation to avoid getting to that point. Clearly not that this would have helped him because this was not, you know, this was a, a tumor, so, but. Wow, I think I'm just so speechless. Um, Gerwin, what a fascinating case and you presented it so brilliantly and Maria, just so, so, so many teaching pearls and such clear teaching on complex topics like constrictive physiology. And I think we are all you know, better prepared to take care of patients with pericarditis, pericarditis in the future, thanks to you. Uh, so really thank you again for, for being here and for all the amazing teaching. And um, to summarize the amazing teaching, we have Yasmin, and Yasmin, I can see some incredible teaching points, so please take us away. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing, amazing case, Dr. Gerline. And these teaching points are just from Dr. Maria. They are, those were great teachings. And we started this with an initial approach to tachyarrhythmias. We had a Dutch reminder type, the atrial being more common. We also talk about the MATs being very usual in patients with lung diseases, and we should look for a P wave morphology. Also think about the reentry pathologies and determine if there is a reason for this tachyarrhythmia, cardiomyopathies, amyloidosis, and any other infiltrative disease that could predispose this, this patient tachyarrhythmias. Also, we saw that he had a familiar history and therefore we, we didn't discard it. Then uh, beware the evolution of the tachyarrhythmias to AFib. Then we turn into the approach to cardiomyopathy. Um, it, there could be tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, weight loss in a patient such as cardiac achexia, and infiltrative disease such as amyloidosis can cause uh, cardiomyopathy, and especially because of the TTE transtraining uh, in the physical examination, look for raccoon eyes, which is a very uncommon but highly characteristic sign of amyloidosis. And also mitral regurgitation murmur can be found on physical exploration of a patient that could have cardiomyopathy. Now for an AFib management, we have a very good pearl where people with atrium enlargement have low success of treatment with rhythm control. So that's why you should try aggressive rhythm control strategies initially to avoid this enlargement. So now we, we went to the EKG and echo approach. We should always have a systematic approach when reading this um, um, tests. Um, there was pericardial effusion, and the way that we can differentiate it from plural effusion is with the aorta. If it's beside the aorta, think plural. If it's above the coronary sinus and the right rat tail sign, think pericardial. Now, we went into the constrictive pericarditis approach, where an enhanced ventricular inter interdependence caused um, can be caused when the RV fails and it pushes the septum into the uh, left ventricular. Uh, on physical examination, we will find this uh, pulsus paradoxus, cosmal sign, pericardial knock. And there is a very special type of uh, constrictive pericarditis, which is a constrictive effusive pericarditis, which puts us in a high risk for hypertension and shock. Now, we can do an MRI to measure the pressure in the ventricles and look for these enhanced ventricular interdependence. But if it's inconclusive, we can do a hemodynamic evaluation looking for the square root sign. And note, these patients should have a colchicine treatment for at least three months and high dose end states until the resolution of the symptoms to avoid this constrictive pathophysiology because pericardial stripping is a very aggressive surgery. Now, inflammatory processes do not diminish with colchicine and end states turn into steroids and lastly use in minimum of lasers. And these are all the teaching points that we have. Amazing case again. Thank you for everyone. Go back to you, Maddie. Wow. Amazing, amazing teaching points. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, and thank you again, Gerline and Maria, for, for being here and for really such incredible uh, teaching tonight.
thank you guys for inviting me. I really had an amazing time. Happy to come back anytime. Thank you so much, Maria. Awesome. Bye, everyone. See you next time.